Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Dr. Emily Knox. Uh, as you heard, she graduated with her BA in Religious Studies here in 1998. Um, she is now an associate professor at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her most recent book, Foundations of Intellectual Freedom, won the 2023 Eli M. Obeller Prize for Best Published Work in the Area of Intellectual Freedom. Knox's articles have been published in the Library, Library Quarterly, Library and Information Science Research, and Open Information Science. Knox serves on the board of the National Coalition Against Censorship and is the editor of the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy. She has been interviewed by NPR, The Washington Post, Time, and Slate, and on this past Tuesday, she testified before the U.S. Senate Committee on the Judiciary regarding book bans. Knox received her PhD from the doctoral program at Rutgers University, uh, her master's in library and information science from the iSchool at Illinois, uh, Illinois, excuse me. She also holds an AM in the same field, um, that being religious studies, from the University of Chicago Divinity School. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Emily Knox. So thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I've given a lot of talks over this past two years or so, but this is very special for me to be back here at Smith. Um, I, I was in Wilder, I should say. <laughs> um, I was there all four years. I was in the same corner. Um, except for my third year, I spent my junior year abroad at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, but then I came back and went to my same corner at, in Wilder. Um, it's also wonderful to be here in this library. Um, I can say as an alum, um, it was fascinating for me to watch the consternation about the new building as someone who studies libraries. And then we get this glorious building, which is often what happens with libraries. Um, a lot of my research is actually about how do people feel about libraries? What, what are libraries? What do they mean to communities? Um, and it was interesting to see all those feelings come up with people um, as this building was being built. And it is glorious, just more wonderful than I could possibly imagine. Um, I teach a little bit about library buildings. I picked up some things uh, that I will be telling my students when I teach libraries, information, and society this spring. But today I'm here to talk about my main area of research, which is books and book banning. So I wanna talk a little bit about this picture. Uh, this is actually from the Tucson Unified School District, which I now see as a bellwether for where we are. So in Tucson, they dismantled the Mexican-American studies program. They did that by walking into the classrooms and boxing up the books and putting them in boxes that said, ban books, please remove, and they took them to a warehouse and then they were just gone. Um, the reason I see this as a bellwether is because it was actually an argument about what people sometimes call critical race theory. But interesting a lot enough, in Tucson, they not only had a Mexican-American studies program, they also had an African-American studies program and a Native American studies program. It was only the Mexican-American studies program that they dismantled. And this really has to do with politics and the demographic change in Arizona. What was going on? This is when they had the papers please law in Arizona. There was a lot of discussion about what is Arizona becoming? And as you'll see through this talk, in fact, what we're going through now is really, what is America becoming? What is our country going to look like in the next 20 years? So this is just a quick overview. I'll talk about why books, uh, why public schools and libraries, why now? And I always say, how can you respond? I really think that I need a call to action because of where we are now. So just a little bit about my background. Um, I came here to Smith uh, in 1994. I did religious studies, um, which I have to say was one of the best things I could have done. Uh, you learn so much about other people and cultures when you do religious studies. 
Um, I went to Hebrew U because I did religious studies and that seemed like a good place to go. Um, I learned a lot about politics and religion living in Jerusalem, which is not surprising. After graduating from here, I uh, went to the University of Chicago, did my AM there. I worked as a law firm for two years, learned I did not want to be a lawyer. Uh, then I went and got my library and information science degree and worked as a theological librarian in New York City. Uh, and then I went to Rutgers. But one thing I kept in mind throughout my work was really how interested I was in banned books. My mother was a high school librarian for 32 years in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we always observed banned books week. So she would bring home the list. Judy Bloom would be on the list. I would be very upset because I loved Judy Bloom. And I would be like, why do people not want me to read Judy Bloom books? Um, so when I was here, I started studying uh, fundamentalism and evangelicalism in America. And I continued that study when I was at the University of Chicago. And then finally, when I got my doctorate, I knew that I wanted to look at one particular question. Why do people try to ban books? What is the point of engaging in this exercise of censorship? So I often start here really with the term intellectual freedom, which I have to say is a bit of a library jargony term. Almost no one talks about intellectual freedom outside of academic types, <laughs> libraries. People say things like free speech, uh, cancel culture. These are the sorts of words that are used. And a lot of time they aren't talking necessarily about what's happening in a library or school. They're really talking about what people are typing on X, X, Twitter, right? That's really what they mean when they talk about things like free speech. Um, but intellectual freedom is a principle that librarians have supported since 1938. So it's a right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. When we think about censorship, this is the suppression of ideas and information. Now, if any of you saw the testimony, what you see is that people get into very semantic games about what is banning, what is censorship. Um, the way I think about it is that censorship is impeding access from, of a particular work so that the people for whom it's intended are not able to read it. So it's not so much that something is necessarily banned, but things can be restricted or redacted or relo relocated. And I call this censorship practices. Um, this is something that we all engage in in various ways. The example I always give for myself is that I don't read or watch horror um, because I like to sleep at night. I'm not interested in not being able to sleep. The only horror I'll ever watch, I don't read it at all is it has to be a true classic. So like I've seen The Exorcist and all those sorts of things, but usually with all the lights on, on a Saturday, while I'm doing other things, right? I'm cleaning or something like that. I'll have it on so I can just understand what's going on in those particular things. So a censorship practice is an action that we do. Um, and I divide these into active and passive practices. Active practices are what I call the four R's. That's redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. So I'll go through a little bit of a definition of those four R's. Redaction is when you mark through something. We see these in classified documents. I do Freedom of Information Act requests, and often people's personal information is redacted. Um, this was also the request in Mouse, if you're familiar with the McMinn County, Tennessee, uh, when they tried to remove Mouse from the school curriculum. Uh, they actually were requesting that they be able to redact the pictures that they didn't like, um, but this their lawyer told them that would be a copyright problem, which is why they decided to, decided to move the book altogether. Restriction, on the other hand, this is really where the intended audience comes into play. I call this putting behind the desk. So this means that you have to go up to the librarian and say, may I please read that book? Or there's a permission structure of some sort. Um, and so that the people for whom it's attended, intended are not able to get it freely. 
Relocation is what you see mostly in public libraries. So this is when something is moved from the juvenile section, for example, for whom it's intended, to the adult section, or to what's called maybe a parenting section, right? So this often happens to um, uh, Roby Harris's book, It's Perfectly Normal. So this is a book for kids about sex education, and it will be moved from the kids section to the adult section, even though it's not intended for adults. Finally, removal is what most people think about when they think about censorship. So this is when something is removed from the collection, but I think this also has to be looked at with a nuanced eye. So it is not the same thing to ask that something be removed from the curriculum or from the school library or from a classroom library or from the public library. These all have different nuances as to what someone is asking for something to happen. So again, those four R's are redaction, restriction, relocation, and removal. Those are active practices. Passive practices are things like self-censorship, which I'm quite worried about right now. This is the idea that people will just not write or create the way that they used to. Um, and also bias. So this would be bias in collection development, mostly for librarians, not wanting to buy something because you disagree with it for some reason. More broadly, I call what I do the discourse of censorship. And I just want to talk about this picture because this is so familiar to me. So this is at a public library board meeting. What you'll notice is that there are no kids in this picture. So all of this discussion is about kids and like what are kids reading? But we rarely hear kids' voices in this. Um, the person who uh, testified with me, Cameron, they're no longer a kid, they're a sophomore in, in college, but I thought it was so important that they have their voice in the testimony because they are a young person who is affected by these policies, by trying to ban books. And so many times we don't hear that voice, we just hear a lot of adults yelling at each other. So when I say the discourse of censorship, I look at the language that is used to justify censorship practices. I look at relationships among power, identity, the nature of knowledge. Um, I'm very interested in the status of public institutions and communities. Um, also the outsider perceptions of institutional practices. Nobody knows how books gets on, get on shelves. They have no idea how that happens. Uh, you walk into a library, there are books they magically appeared, right? I went to my local public library, I just moved, got my library card, they had fourth wing on the new bookshelf. And I was like, well, I'm getting that. Um, Cause I had heard all about it and it has a great cover. Um, but I realized that most people have no idea how that book got on that new bookshelf. It just magically appeared with its cover, with the label on the spine. Also, no one knows how teachers work at all. They have no idea how teachers make curriculum, how they do their lesson plans. These are all very black boxed procedures and policies for the general public. Um, finally, I'm interested in reading practices. So what does it mean to read? Why is reading so important? So, Talking a little bit more about reading practices, what I think about a lot is interpretive communities. I'm specifically interested in uh, Stanley Fish's argument about is there a text in this class? He decides, he says that there is no embedded meaning in a text, that we bring our own baggage to texts. And if we share a particular interpretive strategy and in understanding that text, we're part of an interpretive community. So, this is based on the idea that although we often think of reading as being an individualized practice, actually it's one that is often quite social. I'm sure some of you are on book talk and all those sorts of things. So even if you're reading by yourself, in fact, you're engaging in community. This is actually a banned books club from uh, Kutztown, uh, Pennsylvania. So I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by reading practices. This gets a little bit deeper into my research. <clears throat> 
So basically what I use are past and present models of understanding reading to describe how people read today. So these are all just random pictures of people reading, but I like to start with the monks and reading in the Middle Ages. One of the most important things that happened in the Middle Ages was that we started reading silently. So it used to be that the monks would be sitting in their refectory and they would, some one person would read the Bible out loud while they were working. Why is that important? Well, when you read out loud, someone can interject and say, ah, by the way, this is how you should interpret, interpret that particular piece of scripture or whatever it was, right? Um, you are know what someone is reading and you know where they are and an authority can say, and this is how you should think about it. This is impossible when you have silent reading. And I'll actually show you where this shows up right now. Um, <clears throat> I also talk about the early modern era. So this is really thinking about the Reformation. One of the amazing things that happened in the Reformation is that a doctrine was introduced that said you could save your soul by reading a text. That's actually quite revolutionary. So this is the doctrine of sola scriptura. Basically, if you read the Bible, you can save your soul. How this is passed down to us is that we think reading is very important. What do I have my students do in class? I have them read. Why? So that they can become more knowledgeable about a subject. Um, it also influences how we think about books. So books should contain the truth, and truth should be in books. And it becomes this very circular argument about the actual codex itself. Although you should know that the reformers were very worried about people being able to interpret the text by themselves. This is the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. They actually didn't trust that at all. So what they started doing was writing commentary around Bibles. So I'm sure we have some of those in our special collections, just like all this commentary about like how you should interpret this text because in fact, they did not trust members of the church to be able to interpret texts by themselves. In the modern era, what we see is that there becomes an idea about like who has critical distance from a text. Now, this is sometimes kind of somewhat controversial, but in fact, the only people who have critical distance from a text are men. And I will prove it to you. How many of the books that get on these lists are for men? When was the last time you saw a book that was a thriller on one of these texts? Horror, suspense, they almost never show up. And when they did, when James Patterson's book showed up, everybody was upset and it was immediately just brushed off, right? That's not gonna happen. In fact, women and children are not seen as having critical distance from the text. Um, another way I can prove it to you is that most libraries don't collect erotica, even though they will collect the most violent book you have ever read in your life. Um, the idea that you could be somehow stimulated by reading these books is considered to be something that is not okay. Um, I've had people push back on me about this. I'm like, well, go take a look at your library, you know? See what's going on, take a look at the books. Who is considered to be able to actually have a critical eye when they read? And really adult cis men are the ones who are considered to be able to have a critical eye. So just very briefly, in the United States, this is often combined with the idea of common sense interpretation of the text. So this is from uh, Scottish common sense philosophy. This is the idea that we hold these truths to be self-evident. So a text says what it means and means what it says, which is why people are constantly reading out texts to me. Uh, so if any of you saw the testimony on Tuesday, Kennedy read out all boys aren't blue, um, as if this is convincing, right? The idea like I read you this text, how can you see this as anything other than obscene? 
because that's what the text says. This is truly part of um, this philosophical tradition that was very popular in the 18th century and of course actually is passed down through us through a lot of um, Christian right-wing understanding of how texts work. But it's also just like floating in the ether of our world. <clears throat> so these are a lot of the books that are being uh, challenged right now. And I use the word challenge as opposed to ban because ban implies removal from those four R's while a challenge just means that someone has an objection to a book. So these are all what we call diverse books. Um, some of them have been on the list forever. I Am Jazz, when Jazz published that book, her book has been on there since she published it. Um, some of these books are newer. Uh, drama has actually always been up there. People don't like the later Gator ones. Those pop up all the times because they use uh, text speak. Um, <clears throat> Toni Morrison's books are always on the list. Um, what we, when we say that a book is diverse, what we really mean is that it has a certain political point of view. What I saw in my research is that there are two main reasons giving for challenging diverse books. First of all, books that are about LGBTQIA subjects are always seen as being about sex and therefore unsuitable for the age group. So this is sort of an automatic definition if a book, even if it's about two penguins, is about an LGBTQIA person, then it will be about sex and it's inappropriate. If a book is about a person of color um, or a BIPOC people, then there's an argument that's a little bit different. It's an argument that has to do with um, Chimamanda Adichie's argument about the one story, right? that there's only one acceptable story if you are part of a minoritized population. And it has to be, I think the best way to think about it is a story of like up from bootstraps, right, triumphant, without describing any trauma too much, right? So you sort of gloss over any trauma that might have happened and you very much focus on the uh, triumphant aspects of someone's life. What really pulls all of these together is something called difficult knowledge. So this is one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, this is by Carrie H. Robinson. And she discusses how difficult knowledge is knowledge that many adults find challenging to address in their own lives, but especially with children. And I actually got in an argument with someone today on WGN radio. It wasn't an argument, but the host said to me, well, what if a parent just doesn't want to talk about that? And I said, but that's what you sign up for as a parent. Your child will bring difficult topics to you and you need to be prepared to respond to those topics, even if it is difficult and upsetting for you. Um, and I have realized in that that there are so many things that we are uncomfortable about talking about. I was on a panel with a librarian and she said that she realized that in order to um, advocate for all boys aren't blue and gender queer, that she had to be comfortable talking about sex. And she had never thought about that before. That like she had to really develop her own vocabulary and lower her own discomfort for talking about these books. Um, the reason why they are important is that everyone has the right to be able to describe their own lives. And these books give kids vocabulary to describe themselves. Um, my favorite anecdote about this is that um, in Roby Harris's book, It's Perfectly Normal, there's a depiction of um, a child who goes to their parent and says that they are being sexually abused. And Roby was told that there was a child who was reading the book, went to their mother and said, this is what my father is doing to me. That book actually gave that child the vocabulary to be able to say, this is the truth about my life and also made it so that they could be put in a more safe, safe situation. 
we really are doing our children a disservice if we are not giving them the vocabulary to describe their lives and also the lives of their peers, their friends. Um, what I'm often arguing with people is that, you know, it's not like genderqueer just triggers a kid to decide that they have um, gender dysphoria, right? That's not really how it works. Um, but also, maybe their friend is going through questioning their gender identity and they want to know more, right? That is also what a book does. So this is Rudine Simmons Bishop's argument that books are mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors. People are very focused on books being mirrors and sliding glass doors and not so much about them being windows into another person's life. So I mentioned that I had just heard the argument about reading aloud. So this is from Tuesday. <laughs> this is how I do my research. I take what people say and I look for common themes in their arguments. So this is Max Eden. I'm actually sitting on his left. Uh, you just can't see me. Um, and uh, he is arguing actually about all boys aren't blue right now. And he says, if parents try to read passages, they cut them off because it is too obscene to be read out loud. So if I was going to be doing my discourse analysis of his argument, this would be reading aloud, which I hear all the time, that a book is obscene because it's not even that it's too obscene to be read out loud, it's that it makes people uncomfortable when it's read out loud. There's a lot of discussion about comfort, discomfort. Um, so I keep updating the slide with new things that happen all the time. So I just updated the slide on Tuesday, like, oh yeah, that's what Max even said um, while we were uh, doing that. I really should actually do an entire discourse analysis of that, uh, that testimony. <clears throat> so when I think about interpretive strategies, this is really how I think that people understand books. So um, this is an altered book, which is a beautiful, um, creative way of making books into art. Um, and I think this is how people think about the way that texts work. That basically the illustrations, like the text jumps off the page at you, right? They're not just sitting there, but it actually like somehow gets zapped into your mind. So a lot of people worry about things like common sense interpretation of the text. This is the idea that uh, what I would call polysemic um, interpretations are impossible, only monosemic interpretations are possible. Um, that there's uh, no room for alternative interpretations. They fear undisciplined imaginations. Um, they think about mimesis a lot, that like if you read something, you will mimic it. Um, and there's a lot of concern about short and long-term effects of a book. So basically, if you read about someone doing drugs, you will do drugs. And then in the long term, you will have bad moral character. So there's, I have an entire uh, section of my book about books should edify the soul. And I'm currently working on a paper with my doctoral student about um, clean publishing, right? The idea that you should only have certain ideas and language in um, a book. So this is really where we are now. There were over 2,500 uh, unique, unique titles uh, challenged in the past year in the US. We don't have Q1 and Q2 um, stats yet, but I probably, I do think they'll be even higher this year. You can see that there was a huge jump first um, from 2020 to 2021, and then another jump in 2022. So it used to be that I ended on this uh, particular slide, but this is like, this is really saying, why do people try to ban books? And that is because words have power. We truly believe that reading can change who you are as a person. Um, it, basically, this poster summarizes my research. So if we understand that words have power, 
then it's actually not surprising that people are looking at public schools and libraries right now. So this gets more into our current culture war. The thing to know about public schools and libraries is that they are more or less public goods, that is, they are available to all and everyone can benefit. Um, one of the true values of librarianship is the public good. Um, we do this by supporting information access and the principle of intellectual freedom. But public goods are always contested in our country. I really commend this book to you. This is The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. Uh, she has the famous story about the public pool in Montgomery, Alabama, which rather than desegregate the pool, it was filled in with concrete and does not exist even anymore. Even to this day, Montgomery, Alabama does not have a public pool. Um, we see this happening with libraries. Rather than put five, 10 books that somebody doesn't like on the shelf, people are, being, are willing to close their libraries. Think about all the services that are lost when a library is closed. Um, libraries provide so much for people. Uh, I'm sure many of you saw the pictures of people in the pandemic who were just sitting in the public library parking lots using the Wi-Fi. Um, libraries provide a quiet place for people to just be. There are very few places like that um, that exist. Um, they provide a safe place for students to go after school if their parents can't afford after school care. Um, they help people fill out tax forms. They provide public restrooms. They provide cool places for people um, when it is hot outside and warm places when it is cold. They provide public lunches. They provide study areas. They provide classes. Um, also, a friendly face. Uh, so many libraries are just a place where you can go in and someone will acknowledge you as a person. That you are a person with needs, no matter how young or old you might be. Um, I just gave a talk not too long ago at Edmonton Public Library, and I usually use the electronic uh, resources with my public library. But I was there right before it opened, and I forgot how many people are just lined up for the library to open in the morning. So there are just people just waiting for the security guard to open those doors so they can get inside. And libraries still provide newspapers, still provide magazines. Um, I was upstairs here and I noticed that there is a VHS player in the library. The library is one of the only places, few places where you can get all these things. People are like, oh, where can I go to like, get all my tapes onto uh, a CD or digitize them. I'm like, you can go to the library. That's where you can do that. So that is actually also the problem with libraries, is that they are open to all and everybody can come. This is the argument that Heather McGee makes in this book, that in fact, we are distrustful of public goods. Often this is racialized in our country. Um, and. Uh, it used to be that this was really about schools, but really public libraries have also been um, part in, dragged into this culture war over public institutions in our country. There's also a lot of discussion about indoctrination. Um, I encourage you to actually look at what Moms for Liberty and No Left of Turn have to say. Um, so this is actually, they have a list of people, I don't have the list here, that they say indoctrinate. Um, when I did my paper on the Tucson Unif uh, Unified School District, I actually talked about indoctrination, um, which has formal definitions in education theory, um, and what do people mean by this? But it's a word that is kind of just thrown around, like you aren't educating, you're indoctrinating. But in fact, um, this is actually just a way of people saying, I disagree with whatever is being taught at any given time. Uh, this is a <coughs> recent article in the Chronicle of Education, um, Higher Ed, which is really about how do we understand 
um, where public institutions sit in our country. So Amna Khalid actually talks about accountability versus control. So the idea that people are actually confusing the idea that you can be accountable, that yes, public institutions are accountable, but that doesn't always mean that you have control over what goes on in that particular institution. So why is this happening now? <clears throat> First of all, we are moving to becoming a majority minority country. This is actually something that we see is very, a very difficult shift throughout our society. What does it mean that the current generation of kids under 18 are no longer majority white? What do you teach people that it means to be a US citizen if they are not majority white? How do we talk about our history when we really are incorporating people who have a different understanding of that history than what used to be the understanding of the majority? Also, the pandemic is really important. These are the most recent um, numbers for this uh, last week. So we have had um, almost 7 million deaths worldwide. We've had 1.18 um, million deaths in the United States. Um, the way I'm really noticing this now is, um, and this is not so much my work, but the reintroduction of uh, loosening of child labor laws. Um, I really think this is related to the fact that so many of our service workers uh, left us, died during the pandemic, and this is a new um, population of people. So you hear about, especially Arkansas and some other uh, states saying, well, we need to make it easier for children to work. I'll tell you the way I often think about that is whose children and which children will be working um, with these loosened child labor laws. But I think this is some of the ways that um, we aren't even quite grappling with everything that happened uh, with the pandemic. Most importantly for my work, school came home. So for any of you that have children, I have stepkids. Um, school is a black box. The kid goes to school and then they come back home. And that is it. You do not know what happens. They say, I, I have a 12 year old stepson and you ask him what goes on at school, and he says, it was fine, it was good. You have no idea what happened at all. But during the pandemic, as many of you know, school was at the dining room table. And I think a lot of parents were surprised about how much pedagogy has changed over time. Um, I think that people imagine that pedagogy stays the same, but in fact, there is much more social emotional learning, there's new math, there's all sorts of things that have changed when it comes to teaching. And I think a lot of people were surprised that what they call critical race theory, but is actually a way of describing our history, is taught in schools. Um, my best example for this is actually uh, Columbus Day. So when I was a kid, Columbus Day was just a day off of school and then it had lots of sales, that's it. Um, now there is Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, Columbus Day has become t contested. I have to tell you that for some people that probably came out of nowhere. They have no idea Columbus Day was just a day off, you know, but now it is something else. Also George Floyd's murder and protests, these happen in very small, um, often very white uh, uh, towns around the country. I think a lot of parents were surprised to see their children protesting um, something like this. They said, where did that come from? And we're just in a time of reactionary politics. So just to wrap up, what can you do? You can always read a Rand book. So there is a list of 850 from Representative Krause in Texas. I'm sure there's a book on there that you would like to read. Uh, support the authors who are being targeted. Um, I love Jane Mount and her work. 
Um, this is just you know, some of the books that are out there. Uh, if you work at a library or you love libraries, be prepared and be organized. Don't think that just because you're in a blue state or in a city that this won't happen to you. Um, I often talk to academic librarians and I say, think about what happened in New College in Florida. Um, I really think that, especially for public academic uh, libraries, that collections will be um, reviewed. I think it's how they'll probably put it um, at some point. <clears throat> there are lots of organizations. So I am the chair of the board of the National Coalition Against Censorship. We just um, launched our Kids Right to Read network. This is an answer to Moms for Liberty. You can join, start a chapter in your own um, town. Uh, there's also the uh, Student Advocates for Speech. This is to train students to be able to talk to their peers about why free expression is important. There are also two other national communities. So the United Against Book Bans is put out, is actually a coalition, and CAC is part of it. Um, it's mostly run, excuse me, by American Library Association. This provides a lot of resources. Um, if something does happen in your town, I'm a former president of the Freedom to Read Foundation, which is the legal arm of the American Library Association. So if things get put through the courts, this is how librarians would respond. Um, PEN America, if you are a writer, this is the place for you. Uh, please join PEN, keep abreast of all of their reports. Um, also the National College Against Censorship. It's a true coalition of people and organizations within the Freedom of Expression Network. There's actually something called the Freedom of Expression Network. Um, I should say that NCAC does a lot of work on art uh, which I think is something that's often forgotten, but um, we've had discussions with, say, with uh, Facebook and Instagram about, especially the, we had a campaign called the Free the Nipple campaign, because how do you know if a nipple is male or female if someone is non-binary, right? That doesn't make any sense. So thinking about how do we understand censorship and art, this is something that um, NCAC has long, um, work done. So rather than leaving people with the other poster, I now leave people with this, which is that free people read freely. Um, as Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you will forever be free. And it's important that people don't impede your right to read. You have the right to access books and to read them. Um, and I leave you with a charge. Get involved in your local community politics because it's up to you to make sure that free people can read freely. Thank you. Yeah, so the best place to start is with the American Library Association's lists of banned books. They are put out every year. Um, they're all available online. Um, so start with those lists, because you also, they're true bibliographies. I didn't get to give my speech on the importance of bibliography as a research method, but they are a way of knowing how books have, um, which books have been banned over time and for what reasons, and their larger bibliographies always give sources for that, so you can do primary, um, <clears throat> primary source research on that. Um, for book ban books in general, if you, so I, 
I mean, I have my book on book banning in 21st century America. Um, I think it has a pretty good bibliography on uh, thinking about uh, how people have thought about banned books over time. There are actually three books, if you're looking at it specifically from uh, uh, librarianship, there are three books, um, and I'm gonna forget them, of course, that look from 1876 uh, to around 1967. Um, and uh, the middle one is, the first one is Robbins, and I cannot remember the middle one, the last one is Samek. So if you read those three books in order, you get a good overview of thinking about how people have understood book banned books over time. Mm -hmm. So a question from online, how should libraries determine what books are age appropriate? Oh, so this is what librarians are trained to do. Um, I think this is one of the things where people just do not know what you study in uh, library school. So librarians use tools um, to be able to develop their collections. So no one really, it might seem like things just randomly appear, but in fact, our librarians who are going to be, our students who are gonna be working with youth take things like youth services to learn about the tools that they can use to find appropriate books for students. But I must say that this is very difficult. I really, my heart goes out to middle school librarians because it is so hard to find books for people who are 10 and for people who are 14, right? Like that is just a huge range of development that I don't know how they do that, but we teach classes to help librarians be able to provide the resources that those, that students of various, and I would say the right, the correct term is not so much age appropriate, appropriate, but developmentally appropriate books for everyone who uses the library. Okay, yeah, so just know that these are heuristic devices for thinking about censorship. So passive censorship is when you don't, when you decide not to do something. So you are not going to write a particular book because you are worried about what they'll say about it on Goodreads. Um, also, you have to know that a lot of this is wrapped up in social media and the outside influence that social media has over uh, our, content creation, I guess, is the best way to think about it. Um, so self-censorship would really be about the creator and not wanting to create something. Bias is what you really need to work on if you are a collection development librarian, so in my field. So this would be you saying, I don't wanna buy this book because I don't like it or I disagree with it or the author is a bad person, or something like that. Um, I can go more into my research about how actually intersectional a lot of those ideas are. So um, what I tell my students is, you know, I never hear about people removing Woody Allen's movies from their collections. I do hear about people removing Bill Cosby's books and videos from collections. In fact, what you find is that this is often um, inflected by diverse identities when you think about something like um, bias and collection development. Librarians develop collection development policies. You should follow your policies. It should, your policy should come from your mission of your institutions. Different mission, institutions have different missions. Um, so, um, that is really, you should never be making these decisions in a vacuum. Also, I, I, just another anecdote, I have lots of anecdotes, but one of the most recent ones I saw was um, on ALA Think Tank, which is this raucous uh, Facebook group, I'll just put it that way. If you're interested in what librarians are talking about on Facebook, that's the place to go. Um, they were talking about RFK Jr.'s new book. 
And some of the uh, posters said, we're not buying it because it's inaccurate. And I was like, that is, I understand that you have accuracy in your collection development policy. This is mostly public libraries. But you have many things on your shelves that are inaccurate. Your entire diet section is inaccurate. Your self-help books in general are inaccurate. Inaccuracy is not, is only one criterion that you should use. Um, and I would be disappointed in my public library if they didn't have all the books for, from everybody who is running for the highest office in the land. They should have Marion Williamson's book. They should have RFK Jr.'s book. They should have Mike Pence's book. People's, people have the right to be able to see these books, whether they're uh, um, accurate or not, because these are people who are vying for my vote and I should be able to know what they have to say. So when I think about um, passive censorship, um, it's really not following much more your own personal um, ethics instead of the professional actual ethics that we, are, um, that we should be following as professionals. What might be a compassionate question to ask a citizen who wants to ban or remove certain materials from a library? or challenge a book? So it really depends on what point you're at in that particular request. So I'm a big believer in Ranganathan's five laws of library science. Um, every reader, their book. Every book, their reader. Um, a lot of times, my hope is that they can be stopped at the desk. That's what I call it. So if someone sees a book they don't like, there are thousands of books in the library. I'm sure we can find one that will work for you, right? You hope that would happen. That is not so easy right now. Um, you have to decide where the opposition is coming from. So first of all, do not do this alone. Um, if someone brings a request, um, you should have policies in place to respond to that request. And so there should be a committee, it should go up to the director, um, and you also need to decide who is this person. If they say they're from Moms for Liberty, then you know you're dealing with one thing. If they say like, oh, my kid saw this book and I didn't really like it, that's a different thing. So you have to really look at it from a particular case. This is something I, I cannot really get journalists to understand. <laughs> Just like they try to say to me like, what, what are all the cases? And I'm like, it's very different in different places. So um, don't do this alone. Follow your policies. Please report any requests. Yes? So it depends on the library. What is the mission of the library? That is what really matters. So the library here has a very different mission than say uh, the public library down the street. So you, it's impossible to, for me to answer that question because it depends on what people are using the library for. Um, when I worked at a theological library, it was, um, a library of the Episcopal Church. We were going through a lot about gay ordination. Um, and at that time, we collected every single thing that was related to that topic because that was part of our mission. Whether that was for or against or whatever, it made no difference. We collected it because that was our job. Um, so it's really hard to say that any particular library should not have, should or should not have particular works. We have a genocide studies um, program at the University of Illinois. You can imagine what is needed to support that program, right? Entire collections about, of hate speech. Because how can you study genocide if you're not reading what people say? that eventually leads to genocide. It's impossible to do that. Um, so each library has to have their own policy and their own, um, their, and 
do what makes most sense for according to their mission and their policies. I recently saw a post claiming that people were trying to ban the Bible. It felt like a false backlash claim. But have you actually heard of anyone trying to do that? Yes, the Bible was actually on the most challenged list about four or five years ago, so that often happens. Uh, books get challenged from all points of view. Uh, my favorite story about that was I was doing research with my research team, mapping information access on Alabama public libraries because Alabama is first in the alphabet. That's the only reason we picked Alabama. But we got a request for consideration for a biography of Leonard Skinnerd someone did not like how Leonard Skinner was portrayed in that biography, and they wanted that book removed. Um, I'm sure the librarian was like, we collect all of Leonard Skinner's biographies, we're not removing this one, I'm sorry, you don't like it. You know, like, like that's just how that is. You see the most amazing things that show up. Well, we are at time. Oh, and so speaking of amazing, thank you so very much for joining okay. us today. Well, for thank you so our much. Questions and uh, maybe one more round of applause. Thank you. Thanks.